hot cuppa and relax. It's Afternoon Karak with Aisha al Mazmi and Mikhail Atia on Pulse 95. Weekend vibes only here on the Afternoon Karak and we want to keep you guys uh, just sort of urging you and recommending you this once, uh, once a year event here in Sharjah, the Exposure event. Really want you guys to book up uh, your, your tickets on exposure.ae. Mm. Aisha has uh, Aisha Hannibalkis and uh, Rania Sadi have been hosting there. If you want to get a chance to meet up with them and uh, you know maybe get an autograph, take a picture with yes, them. Yes, it's all for free. We're all learn. very friendly here. At Pulse 95. Incredibly friendly. And again, for free, guys. Because, you know, why would we let you guys... Why would we ever charge you for this? Because we love you guys. You can come <laughs> and take pictures as well. They come. can take one picture. But if you want to take another picture, that's what Mikhail, you're going to... I'm sorry, <laughs> but who uh, made you my manager again? It's just something like that. I just feel like as a co-host, I, I got to I gotta also be a co-manager, you know, something like that. Again, who gave you that permission? I don't remember signing some papers because that requires it's like a, agreements. It's like a and verbal agreement because we're the dream team. Team, you know, I, I just oh, look it so out for now you. Now we are the dream team. You, you, you want to make sure that the pictures that are circulated out there uh, about you that are, you know, they're of value, rarity, so and they have some kind of like market value of some kind. So when people trade those pictures, it's kind of like paparazzi style. It's like, whoa, I got a picture by you shall mask me or something. I hope, <laughs> I hope you guys are tuning in to our live stream. Maybe so it's you, a little too weird. Yeah, I, don't I know. hope you guys are tuning into our live stream on YouTube so you can see my exact facial expressions as he tries. To clean this up and make it seem like he wants the good for us. And even though I know deep down, there are some ulterior motives, aren't there? No, but really, uh, at is, the end of it, it all... Is it? Is it? The, is it? Is it? <laughs> see? I see right through him, guys. At the end I of see the, right through him. What matters is that you go, guys, check out Exposure Absolutely. at the uh, Expo Center. Sharjah, book your tickets at exposure.ae. Tons of great stuff to check out there Absolutely. and so much more. But back to the show. Back to the show. Boy, Ooh, this yeah. seems like the punishment hour. There's a lot of uh, repercussions in terms of these stories that we're mm-hmm. going to talk about. Uh, but first, obviously, we're going to continue the saga of cyberpunk. Yes. It's getting worse and worse, unfortunately. Yeah. And because like they said, they gave them 48 hours and now we do not really know where 48 hours ended. I mean, 48 hours for us, technically, also. It was. It is. That's, that's the thing. Because yeah. we said that we don't know when uh, they actually got the threat. So they could have gotten it a day before that. But apparently there have been, you know, they actually they found the source code up on the internet. So it's already circulating and it's a big trouble for CDPR. We're also going to be talking about this funny story. The reason why it's funny is because Mikhail and I were going to be talking about how it's a rumor. And then the rumor was debunked. And the actual cast of The Last of Us has been announced. Yesterday, we're going to talk about how they might have offered the role to Maharshal Ali. Mm -hmm. But now it's been confirmed that Pedro Pascal has been confirmed to be Joel. And Mikhail apparently has a mini rant, apparently. Just a little. You know, as someone who's played the games, I'm very Mm -hmm. passionate about this franchise. And and I've been thinking about the casting for so many years now. Now that it's confirmed... Well, you know, I, I do want to share my little, you know, little scent on he it. He has, he has a lot. He says little, but I feel like hope you guys I are prepared. I got three minutes. That's that's how we're putting that's it. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm gonna give you, because otherwise, I know it's gonna go on for the next hour and oh, a half. Yeah. We're also gonna be talking some more about Pedro Pascal. Apparently, year 2021 is a year of Pedro because he also been cast in another movie by Judd Apatow, and it's about the pandemic, and it's like. We're not even out of the pandemic, and there's already several movies and TV shows about the pandemic. But this one might seem interesting. We cannot wait to talk about that and so much more right here on the afternoon cutback. But before I let you go, here is a nice Disney throwback to just get you the entire energy and whatnot because we want you to be excited with us. Text us 4215 with Salat or do, and also sing along with us. Make a hot cuppa and relax. It's Afternoon Karak with Aisha al Mazmi and Mikhail Atia On Pulse 95. So while we were preparing the running order for today, I came across a piece of news uh, last night that said that there are rumors going on that Maharshala Ali is going to be cast as Joel, Joel from The Last of Us. I was like, ooh, that's super cool. It might have been bringing some controversy because obviously Joel is seen as a 
um, you know, as a, as a North American man, as in he has uh, like a European descent kind of person. So mm-hmm. he has his light skin, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Meanwhile, obviously, Marshall Ali is obviously African American. So would people be up? What is going on with that? It would have been an interesting discussion. But then four hours later, in the, like, the earliest hour, it's like 6 or 7 a.m., I checked the news and it says that Joel has already been cast and it was Pedro Pascal. And I was like, you know what? That that could work. Again, I haven't played The Last of Us. Yeah. But I can kind of see him as Joel. I mean, everybody has seen pictures of Joel. They know how he looks like. So I can kind of see him, especially since Pedro is one of the most fantastic actors. He's been in Hollywood for the longest time ever, but I feel like he's finally getting what he deserves. The breaking news actually came from Neil Druckmann uh, Druckmann himself, the creative director and creator of Last of Us. And, uh, you know, I will agree, uh, for a long time, I thought just a fan cast would have been Russell Crowe as Joel Mm -hmm. and Ellen Page as Ellie, ironically enough, because there was a time when the game came out uh, that Ellen Page even sort of said Elliot Page El- okay, Elliot she's Page She's now Elliot Page Elliot He's Page. now Elliot Page Yes Oh boy Anyway uh, What I'm actually more focused on Is the cast for Ellie And it's also been confirmed It's going to be played by Bella Ramsey mm-hmm. Now if anybody knows who she is She's the 14 year old girl uh, Who played the uh, the leader of the House of Bear In mm-hmm. uh, Game of Thrones Yeah uh, Liana Mormont And she was a fan favorite Because you know uh, Game of Thrones is a very bleak and you know a, a show in, uh, about you know that's all about despair it's hopeless but you see this 14 year old girl you know she's an orphan she is the head of her own house mm-hmm. and it's not it's not the strongest house in the north right but she stands up she's fierce she's strong you know she's there to serve the king of the north which yeah. is uh, and uh, forgot his name oh my god uh, but anyway uh, <laughs> people people really loved her and what was even great we got a nice send off uh, at the final uh, the the, uh, the winter battle mm-hmm. in season eight. Yeah, and uh, to hear that she's getting this role, I am a little bit skeptical about it because what? she 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 uh, Bella she plays really well when it comes to a very monotone, very serious character. You know, especially so young at her age. Mm-hmm. But Ellie's not really like that all the time. Actually, do you know how old Bella is? Might uh, surprise you. She's actually 17. Okay, mashallah. So well, she's older, but she looks younger, which I yeah. also wanted to add that that is perfect because if they're going to make a Last of Us 2, it's also going to work out later on when she is a bit older. She can also continue and reprise her role, which I believe is could be one of the reasons they picked her because that is the issue with a lot of, well, when it comes to casting anybody who was young or has to play a child, when it comes to continuity, it becomes an issue. We want them to probably stick around a certain age so when you have somebody who looks young looks believably young exactly yeah. for example when we have Tom Holland who obviously is, is in his mid 20s early 20s but he plays a 16 year old so even if we come in like in around 5 or 4 years later it's a good chance he can still maintain his yeah. teenage or early 20s look despite being maybe close to 30 even then so I think that could have also affected their choice my only shred of doubt about Bella Ramsey is that she might play too much of a monotone character which Ellie's Mm. not by the way in the games and the first one especially she's very lively she likes to make jokes Mm -hmm. you know and she's always so curious you know she has that innocent uh, sort of uh, childlike wonder in a world that's so hopeless so I hope she can really deliver on that on that sort of believable attitude I want to add as well yeah she's also a voice actress and so this, this means that I honestly I believe in her I know she can do it because voice acting requires a lot of animation just through your voice so mm-hmm. I believe even though I haven't watched her anything including the Game of Thrones and uh, she was also in another show as well I believe from the BBC she's and she also plays Hilda from Netflix everybody knows Hilda and Hilda as well is very like the way you're describing um, Ellie she's very you know exciting and very young and very loud and excitable so I yeah. think she can probably nail it just give her I hope a so. chance I'm yeah. def- I'm, you know what I'm not putting any I'm not putting any shred of doubt here mm-hmm. benefit of the doubt yeah. I wish them all the best can't wait to hear and see more details about uh, the development for The Last of Us show. Mm -hmm. When the day comes that we get to watch it, I believe me, I'm the first person here to sit down on the show to review it for you guys. Inshallah, we will be reviewing. And when it comes out, we still have ways ahead. And we know with the pandemic, we don't know how long that's going to drag. It might 
push some stuff. But we're going to wait and see, inshallah, as even the rest of the cast is announced and we get more details. We're going to move to another Pedro Pascal uh, news. And this time we're going to be talking about a movie that he's been cast on called The Bubble about the pandemic. But it has an interesting twist in it, sort of... Um, Somewhat breaking the third wall in this movie. I, I think this would be a good pandemic movie. Let's talk about that coming up next right here on the Afternoon Karak. <sighs> Make a hot cuppa and relax. It's Afternoon Karak with Aisha Al Mazmi and Mikhail Atia. On Pulse 95. Judd Apatow, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly. I believe I am. He has set the cast for his upcoming Netflix meta comedy. Basically, it's going to be a comedy that is also kind of very metaphysical, as in it's making fun of something that is actually happening. As self aware humor. Exactly. That's exactly it. Self aware humor because it's going to be about the pandemic. It's called The Bubble. And I know I'm one of the many people who are already tired about the whole pandemic narrative with movies and TV shows. Oh, it's going to be milked for a while. Oh, know? yeah. But here's the thing. What I like about this one, because it's metaphysical, uh, it's basically what they're talking about is a bunch of actors and actresses stuck in a hotel because they're trying to get, you know, a movie film, but the pandemic is in the way. And it's called The Bubble. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it a chance because this sounds like one of the most, although it's one of the most, you know, obvious yeah. storylines or plot lines if you're going to talk about the pandemic, but I feel it's the smartest one out of all of them so far. It so actually reminds me of um, the, the film that came out recently by Seth Rogen and James Franco, The Disaster Artist, that oh, tells yeah. the story of uh, the, the creator of The Room, mm -hmm. you know, and there's something, there is something comedic about seeing the behind the scenes, the uh, the the impending frustration and challenges of, of trying to f film something, you know, mm -hmm. and and in the in the context of the pandemic and uh, you know things getting locked down, you know I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are curious how do filmmakers make their movies mm -hmm. at a period uh, that is causing so many restrictions. And you got actors who I know you gotta you gotta always try to like you know you know take care of them. Yeah. You, you gotta create an, as a director the stress of micromanaging different departments and the mm -hmm. actors and even trying to complete the film in time with a budget, yeah, that could make for some crazy comedy. Absolutely. So I'm super excited for this one, especially since Pedro Pascal is also going to be in it. Also named in the cast is Maria Bakalova and Fred Armisen, who is also a fantastic actor. So I'm super excited for this one. No release date yet, but you know Netflix, they usually push things and they usually stick within... Um, a specific uh, when they say that this is coming out at this time they're gonna they're gonna stick to it more or less hopefully the pandemic ironically will not push this movie further we will talk about it of course when it comes out and also we're gonna be reviewing it inshallah when it comes out whenever it comes out now we move on to a repercussion segment we're gonna be talking about two news stories that are all over the entertainment uh, world about two people getting well what they deserve. What they deserve, more or less. Let's talk about that coming right up, right here on the Afternoon Karak. <sighs> Make a hot cuppa and relax. It's Afternoon Karak with Aisha Al Mazmi and Mikhail Atia. On Pulse 95. An ongoing discussion we've had here on the show uh, in regards to Ray Fisher, the actor who played the role of Cyborg in the Justice League. For almost a year now, he's been quite uh, open about his uh, mistreatment uh, in the Justice League production. And he has a couple of people to blame. There's some pr some pr producers involved, but one that he feels has was the the most like the most enabler uh, of uh, of inappropriate behavior is Joss Whedon. Mm -hmm. You guys know him for directing the uh, Avengers movie yeah. back in 2012, and also uh, working on the Justice League after Zack Snyder left. Mm -hmm. But it seems that there is even darker. There's a darker history to this man, mm -hmm. as uh, some more actors have uh, uh, spoken out. Spoken out, mm -hmm. uh, namely Charisma uh, Carpenter, who played uh, Cordelia, Cordelia mm -hmm. Chase in Buffy. She uh, just went on. Uh, she just yesterday she talked about how uh, Whedon 
has abused his power on numerous occasions while working on Buffy and spin on the spinoff Angel. She claimed that he had a history of being casually cruel, uh, mm. such as with ongoing threats to fire her and calling her fat when she was pregnant, and then eventually firing her after she had given birth. So apparently Oof. she says that oh, everything he said had traumatized her to this day. And remember, this was filmed back in 1997 all the way to 2003. So this is... Uh, this constant abuse. Exactly. You know? It was decades long. It left a scar on her. And this just... Honestly, I'm not sure what was Joss Whedon doing. And apparently, what I'm understanding, since um, Angel and Buffy were also owned or at least aired under the helm of Warner Brothers, which basically means that Warner Brothers has been enabling him for years and years and decades. So just basically just... Warner Brothers, what exactly are you doing? This is not the first time. Again, this is the second time somebody yeah. comes up. And Ray Fisher was backed by some of his cast. And same here. One of them is um, Sarah Michelle G Geller, who is, who used to play Buffy. Even she backed up uh, Charisma, which tells you that this is real and this has been happening wherever Joss Whedon was. And when we're just waiting now, are any of the actors and actresses who are in the Avengers, are they going to speak up as well against Joss Whedon's injustices as well? What's going on over there? It's very upsetting to find out about this. Yeah, it certainly is. And, you know, you always ask yourself, is there some kind of poetic justice to it all? We don't know. Warner I mean, Bros. I'm, might just sweep this on the rug again, you know? I don't think they can anymore. This is another group of people who come came out and they're saying this has been happening again for at least 25, 26, 27 years. So that's a very long time ago. And another person who got, well, what they deserve is Gina Carano, who has been dropped from The Mandalorian by Lucasfilm for what they quote, abhorrent posts. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to go on a mini rant right now. Okay. So usually people believe that they go like free speech, which is absolutely perfect. What people don't understand is what free speech constitutes as, um, it means that you will not be prosecuted injustly, you know, with unjust reasons. That's what it means. That means if you say, Methanen, I do not like pink. I do not have the right to fight and be like, no, you're not allowed to. And the law would be on my side. That's how uh, free speech works. But it yeah. also means that you are not free from repercussions and criticism exactly that means that if you are actually at fault if you do say something really bad you're also going to be held accountable for it and if it is actually bad what you said is actually very harmful or terrible like that can be proven then you're gonna face these repercussions and that's exactly what she faced yeah. it's not like she was going around being like um, I don't prefer this color or this outfit was not really nice on the Mandalorian. That's different. That's me going like, mm, yeah, uh, that, that did not fit me. That was kind of uh, uncomfortable to wear. Maybe the suit was uncomfortable to wear. She has the right to express her opinion about that. Mm -hmm. But actually going and making all these uh, racist remarks just openly on her Twitter or Instagram account, that is a problem, honestly. A reckless disregard. And I know it's going to be very damaging for her career. And so it's a hard it's a hard lesson learned, you know. Um, Absolutely. Just there's no reason, especially at a at a position like that, you know, where you are you're working with Lucasfilm, you're an actor at the Man Mandalorian. How many people get opportunities like that? Mm -hmm. Don't burn those kind of bridges. Absolutely, do not burn these kind of bridges, especially with Disney that owns Lucasfilms and owns a whole wide array of studios beneath them and production studios. So that means you already are cut off from so many working opportunities just because you decided to be hateful on the internet. It is never worth it to be hateful on the internet for whatever reason. First of all, you're hurting people. Second of, all, second of all, you will face the repercussions and you will damage your own career. And I believe she is one of many people who has been facing this kind of repercussions for the past five or so years. And although we were, we used to be fans of Joss Whedon, we hope that Warner Brothers and basically anybody else who is working with him or are going to work with him, really look at him as a person and make the right decisions because if he truly has been a horrible person, he deserves to be held accountable for it. Text us 4215 with Salat or do tell us what you feel about this entire discussion. Do you agree with us? Do you agree with those decisions? Or are they quite unjust? Tell us all about it. We're going to be taking a short break. We've got these sports headlines coming up and much more right here on the Afternoon Karak. <sighs>
Make a hot cuppa and relax. It's Afternoon Karak with Aisha Al Mazmi and Mikhail Atia on Pulse 95. I say this again, CD Projekt Red just can't catch a break from lawsuits to disastrous launch to uh, uh, buggy patches and now having their source code and even the their engine, their game engine, literally stolen by hackers. And uh, there was like a uh, sort of like a, a demand, a ransom demand uh, in which uh, CD Projekt Red had to, you know, uh, give them an answer or comply to their demands mm-hmm. within 48 hours. Well, 48 hours has passed and now these hackers are moving quick by trying to auction out the source code for Witcher 3, Gwent, Cyberpunk 2077, and the game engine, the red engine, Mm -hmm. in the black market. Oh my god. The thing is, CDPR did not actually outright say that, hey, we found our source code uh, you know, on the internet. It was actually a Twitter account uh, called VX Underground who noticed that CD Projekt Red's ransom data has been leaked online. They noticed the uh, the codes and whatnot. They like, yeah, they connected the dots and they realized that it's out there. And that's probably a warning. Mm-hmm. And here's a bit of it. You thought we were joking. Either you comply to what we asked for or everything is going to go up there on the internet that you're going to, everything will be gone. So yeah. what is worth is... Is being stubborn worth it or should they just comply with it? You know how they say usually in movies they're like, yeah. um, uh, we don't negotiate with terrorists. That's that's the stance they're taking. But yeah, those people are a sort of terrorist. They're terrible people. But at the same time, perhaps negotiate with them because you have no choice right here, maybe? My, my opinion on this is the fact that what... If somebody gets their hands on the source code for mm-hmm. for for all of all of their game, yeah, um, they wouldn't really be able to do much because if they do, uh, if anybody has the source code, tries to manipulate it and publish it online, they'll immediately be illegally attacked because, of course, it's not their it's not their material. Yeah. Um, what we do know is. So far, the source code is being uh, auctioned out at the starting bid of a million dollars or seven million dollars if you just want to buy it right now immediately without an auction. Now, my... my that's cheap, kind of, to it, be honest. It's pretty cheap. So that's what I'm saying. They should have just yeah. complied with them and given them a million dollars. You know what I think Cyberpunk might do? Yeah. And uh, just... I think that they're actually going to do like a scorched earth strategy where they're going to just release the source code themselves online and basically create no value to it at all because it's already leaked all online and just don't even give the hackers an advantage. Like it's become to this extent in my opinion. Again, it just depends, just like you said, on their point of view. What do they see as... uh would incur less loss on them because they already lost a lot, right? Or to take into consideration everything that has happened to them in the past couple of months as, you know, they're quite weak. They're not at their, you know, their best they stage are ever. Weak, uh, damaged reputation, vulnerable virtually yeah. in, in, in every kind of way. Mm-hmm. The, this story is, has, has no ending to it. Oh, my God. And also to add to that, that even though you're right, absolutely right, that... If somebody does use the source code, they will be immediately attacked and they'd, everybody would know this is the source code from yeah. The Witcher or Gwent and uh, but basically from There's CDPR. no way you can commercialize it. But here's the question. But if somebody is, um, you know, a very well-known or, or a good developer, can't they mess around and just use it as a base or something or to draw inspiration and then make their own successful game? That's being the sold thing. in the black market. Who knows what? kind of nefarious purposes I love are they like gonna... nefarious I'm pretty sure somebody's gonna buy it and to make it a game that's all or not just gonna be a, that a, nefarious you know like a rich collectible item of some kind it's like mm-hmm. haha you know I have it on me but it, I don't think that would be smart of them to be saying that because if they say that people will know and then they might get prosecuted for it well you know I'm sure there's a couple of rich guys out there who managed to get some uh, some uh, s- some really rare pieces of art and I'm sure they don't brag about it because they know they they should in the first place maybe <laughs> all all via options we, we just need to wait and see honestly this is probably gonna get some you know, some sort of update within the next couple of hours 24 hours to 48 hours as we find out whether cdpr will actually bend towards these terrorists or are they going to just you know imagine let they, them do whatever imagine they, they want. put a bit on their own their own source code they have to buy it back <laughs> yeah that would be quite oh, upsetting man. that would be bad now we're gonna move on to another story that was touchy took me by a shock but i'm kind of welcoming it it's about 
about Velma from Scooby-Doo. She is getting her own animated series and is also going to star her much older. Stay tuned for that. Not in the news. Not in the news. Weirdness that happened today. 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 True story. Earlier, I think in the week or perhaps actually yesterday or two days ago, we saw news of um, this lawyer who accidentally turned himself into a cat on Zoom as in he turned on a filter and he was he was actually made notified of it and he was told, hey, you look like a cat right now. There's a filter. Can you turn it off? Yeah. And the funny thing about this entire ordeal is that as his assistant, you know, tried to fix it, he goes like, I am not a cat like we are well aware of that sir that you are not a cat yeah. and apparently less than 24 hours later this similar story has happened again where another lawmaker why are they always lawmakers um he accidentally turns himself again into this time not a cat but a floating head as in his head was yeah. just floating and going around in circles and it just look it's just quality content to be honest. It's fantastic. What makes it so funny is that he this guy is just having a serious conversation. You know, he just he's so in the zone, right? And everybody at the the House of uh, the the House Financial Services Committee mm-hmm. were telling me, uh, excuse me, excuse me, could you just take a moment to stop and you know maybe fix your your camera angle because it looks really you just can't take him seriously. Absolutely you know? not. It's, it's so I, it's it's a weird irony of some kind. It's like a guy talking very seriously. You got to focus, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but then everybody's like, no, 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 stop for a moment because we can't take you seriously, you know. I love it. It's just the funny thing is. It's like no matter what, I've never managed to turn on any sort of filter on Zoom. I've used my Zoom, yeah. I mean, for nearly a year now, since like halfway through the pandemic around April. That's when I started getting used to it. And I was, I never managed to accidentally or on purpose turn on any filters. I didn't even know there were filters on Zoom. But for some reason, all these elderly lawmakers keep on accidentally pressing on them and triggering them. They were probably fiddling around with it the night before. But they forgot that they the settings are still there. <laughs> it's just beautiful content. Honestly, oh, thank man. you so much to these lawmakers for accidentally doing those things. We're not trying to make fun of them, but it's just, you know, beautiful quality content. Which is why a lot of us have anxiety right now when we open up Zoom. It's like, is mute. our camera on? Are we mute? Camera. Absolutely. You know, just, you, you, the silliest of mistakes like this could happen and you don't want that. So. But come on, again, comedy relief for the entire world. Yeah, comedy relief, but then there's, you know, al <laughs> well, you know, I, oh, when I think about some things that happen on Zoom, I, I kind of cringe. But do it guys, happens. Texas 4215, it's a lot to do. What are some of your funny, awkward, crin- uh, cringy uh, Zoom meeting or call that you've had at your expense to share here on the Afternoon cut Yes, please do. Coming up next is a story we promise you. Velma Dinkley getting her own series as an adult starring Mindy Kaling. <sighs> Make a hot cuppa and relax. It's Afternoon Karak with Aisha Al-Mazmi and Mikhail Atia On Pulse 95. Really great news for anybody who uh, actually has a subscription to HBO Max. I'm looking at my brother, Raf, <laughs> who every time he gives it to me and I try to log in, it doesn't work. For obvious reasons, Mikhail. Why HBO, are you even you trying? Just have a global release already. But what I really like is that they are pumping out some new uh, new shows, uh, adult cartoon uh, shows. Mm-hmm. The one that I actually did not think they were going to uh, bring back is Clone High, which was uh, sort of like an old... It's like it came out in the early 2000s. Yeah. The premise was that it's a high school of clones uh, of the historical figures like mm-hmm. Cleopatra, uh, uh, Gandhi, you know, mm-hmm. uh, JF Kennedy and stuff like that. And But they're like a m- much younger... Like like in their high school years and you know only had two seasons and then it kind of got canceled and for some reason i think tiktok kind of revived it you know because there's some memes and trends that come out of it and it's so so surprised to hear hbo is bringing it back for a reboot or sort of like a revival but another one that i'm also very surprised about is the announcement for a an, an animation spinoff only based on the story of velma from scooby-doo and it's going to be a little bit more mature. It's not going to be like the family-friendly, cartoony-esque style of Scooby-Doo, mm-hmm. but more of an origin story and I think a more cynical take 
because as you guys know, Velma, she's she's very cynical, you know. She can, No, she is not. In a way. She's realistic. She's not cynical. That's not the same thing. I think you haven't watched there was a there was a recent Scooby Doo series on I've Cartoon Network. I watched everything Scooby Doo, please. I grew Go on up YouTube on that. and write Velma compilation and I swear people there, there's a really good one that just sort of depicts the kind of personality she has. Her modern personality. Not we're not talking the old one where she's nerdy, kind of introverted. Yeah. You know. So I think they're gonna go for that modern take with her. I don't think she's introverted either. She's an extrovert. Here's yeah. the thing. I need to explain this for the millionth time to all my fellow people in the world. Introvert does not mean antisocial. Introvert just means something different. Yeah, introvert could mean reserved, you know. But not even reserved either. I mean, people were... I, okay, this is a separate story, but I posted on my Instagram story. I asked people, do they see me as an introvert or an extrovert? Everyone wrote extrovert for God knows what reason, just because I'm very loud and, you know, very talkative. While I'm actually, I'm a complete introvert. It's just that because I, that's what I give off. I give off extrovert energy. Or at least people believe that this is what an extrovert is like. That they're very up there. They're out there. But I'm actually an introvert. Because an introvert can also be, you know, very talkative. Loves talking. Loves doing all of these things. It's just that we have a finite amount of energy. Now, Social here's the thing. energy. Exactly. Yeah. I actually, yeah, it's expanded as I started working, meeting more people. This is why it appears like, oh, I never sit down in one place. But I get exhausted and I need to recharge right after that. So again, she's not an introvert. Okay. Not, maybe she is an introvert, but I feel like she's more of a... More like in the spectrum. Maybe an yeah. ambivert, maybe. But the thing is, I'm very excited about this one. did not see this one coming just like Mikhail. And I'm very happy that HBO is kind of uh, going in that direction. They're kind of catering to their adult audience. Because just like we said, a lot of us are growing up. We grew up watching these things. It only makes sense that we want to also have our characters grow up with us as well. So yeah. when you're rebooting or you're remaking something, it would make sense if you would continue their life along with us. Similar to what Hilary Duff wanted to do with the Lizzie McGuire TV show, but obviously did not work out. We're not sure when this is coming out, mm -hmm. but sooner hopefully than later. Now, my other question is, why Mindy Kaling? No offense to her. Yeah, you're I right. love her. I, don't, I was going to say something. I love her. <laughs> Come on, she's a lovable person. Yeah, but, but that maybe but the voice doesn't suit the character. Maybe. If yeah. she can change her voice, perhaps, maybe it can work out. But also, again, just like we said uh, a couple of days ago, we're very much advocates for bringing back the actual voice actors and actresses to reprise their roles. You know, every time we see those characters brought back again and again, super excited for this one very happy about it cannot wait for it but we're going to be taking a short break and we've got our final segment before we send you off towards the weekend so stay tuned for that it's almost 5 p.m that was afternoon karak for dessert aisha and mikhail suggest this is the last segment here on the Afternoon Cut-Up for the last day of this week. And if you missed out on any of the discussions for today and the rest of the week and the week before and all that, you can tune in to our YouTube channel. We upload all of our episodes daily right after the show at Pulse95 uh, Radio. You can support us by subscribing as well as tuning in to our podcast on all audio platforms such as SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Rami. Just type in Afternoon Cook and you're good to go. But let's wrap up the hour with a final suggestion. If you got no plans for the weekend, Aisha got you hooked. I mean, we've been trying to say this the entire hour, guys. Check out Exposure. You're hyping it up not only because Pulse95 is going live every day except on Friday. That was also because, again, we've been having fantastic discussions. I mean, even today during our live show from 11 a.m. all the way till 1 p.m. on Saturday, we're going to be back from 4 p.m. till 6 p.m. Again, the photographers were fantastic. We got a whole glimpse into different topics, different subjects, different things. So one, first of all, check out the other podcast for the Exposure Live Show. And also come down to Exposure itself and speak to those photographers because they're international and local photographers. Some of them are actually um, based here in the UAE and they are just available right there at your you just basically at your door, you can approach them and ask them about their galleries, speak mm -hmm. to them about their exhibitions, speak to them about how to get into this field. I mean, at the beginning, most of the ones who we've spoken to, they would tell us about um, 
being photojournalists or becoming, you know, just uh, freelance photographers or photographers who want to send out a message. Meanwhile, like you even spoke today to uh, Aiden J. Sullivan, who actually is in the industry for God knows how long, mashallah, has been for a very long time ago since he was young. And he basically worked in Getty Images as well. So he's talking about the industry. He knows the ins and outs of the industry. He's probably going to be available over there at Exposure. He also spoke to Samuel Ferran, who is uh, a French uh, photographer who does landscape. He's been doing it for two decades. And he's doing fantastic work. We also spoke to Emma Francis, who is actually 23 years old and has already been taking pictures of Boko Haram. She's been in uh, all kinds of places across the entire world talking about conflict, everything happening. So many great people. Again, right there in front of you at your grasp. Take advantage of this event. We don't know when it might come back. Maybe it will come back later on again this year. Maybe we'll come back next year because because of the pandemic, we missed out on it last year, which mm-hmm. was unfortunate. So take and uh, be absorb all of this knowledge and all of these interesting subjects. Take advantage of this event. All available at the Sharjah Expo Center. So much talent, renowned photographers, world-class exhibitions, seminars, workshops, and much more. Go to exposure.ae. Again, exposure.ae. And that is it, guys, for the afternoon cut. I hope you enjoyed the show, but don't worry. We got Yalla Home. Anna Schofield and Big Hass are going to keep you guys busy and entertained from 5 till 8. Wishing you guys a lovely and fantastic weekend only here on Pulse 95. If you liked this episode of Afternoon Karak, drop a like and subscribe. Pulse 95. Be sure to follow us on Instagram for all our daily updates and top stories.